morning. <coughs> I want to uh, speak of Joyce's three major works as representing three parts of what was to have been a four-work sequel. He died at the age of uh, 59 uh, quite suddenly from some kind of uh, intestinal poisoning and um, <coughs> that was the end of the story. And so we don't have the last work, but uh, I have some hints as to what it was to have been, which I'll be able to deal with after we've dealt with uh, Finnegan's Wake tomorrow. Uh, the model for Joyce's life was Dante. And uh, the, the first work that I'm going to deal with, the portrait of the artist as a young man, is uh, the counterpart of Dante's Vita Nuova. Now the Vita Nuova has to do with Dante's uh, uh, enchantment in Beatrice. It's a anthology of the poems that he wrote in celebration of her as a young poet. And then he brought them together and wrote an introduction to each poem describing the circumstances that had inspired it and he followed each poem with an aesthetic analysis of its form and the, uh, the sense of the formal structure. Beatrice died and in the very middle of the Vita Nuova, we have the poem associated with Beatrice's death. And with that, his uh, attachment to her, or his regard for her, is transferred from her physical to her spiritual presence. So there is a, a transformation of mood. Now this device, you might say, of uh, dividing a book precisely in the center for the moment of crisis is one that Joyce took for every one of his works. Uh, when you open the uh, portrait of the artist as a young man in the center, you come to a crisis, which I'll be describing later on, which is the real crisis in the uh, th spiritual development of the young hero here. You open Ulysses exactly in the center, and uh, you find the crisis there. You open Finnegan's Wake, and you can almost just look at the number of pages in the book, divide by two, open at that page, and you'll, you'll see what uh, <laughs> Joyce is giving you. Ulysses takes us through the Inferno and Purgatorio. It is uh, those two. The Finnegan's Wake is the earthly paradise at the summit of the Purgatorio. And the last work was certainly to have been the Paradiso. Now Joyce announces themes already in the portrait which are developed in Ulysses and further developed and manipulated in Finnegan and they were to have been brought to a uh, very clear, lucid, simple statement in the last work. The name of the hero is Stephen Dedalus. <coughs> a Dedalus is the classical patron of the arts. He is the one that uh, built the labyrinth to house the Minotaur and when himself <coughs> enclosed in the labyrinth and he, that he had made and he himself couldn't get out, uh, he and his son 
Icarus are imprisoned in the labyrinth, he turned his mind to unknown art and created wings of art by which he flew. Now, when you open the portrait of the artist as a young man, <laughs> this copy, by the way, I bought in Paris back in 1927, and so it, uh, <laughs> it's just falling apart a little bit. Um, in, the, in the title page here, we see in Latin, et in jotas animum dimitted in artes, and he turns his mind to unknown arts. This is from Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's a direct quote, uh, book eight, line 188. The printer fails to put the second eight on that, and so for about 40 years, no one could find it except someone who happened to have read the Metamorphoses, <laughs> which I happened to have done. And uh, so I've written in the extra eight. I think in, in recent publications, the correct reference is given. But what this refers to is Daedalus about to fly from the imprisonment in Crete to the mainland of uh, Europe. Now, why does uh, Stephen Daedalus uh, start his book with this? because on wings of art, he is going to fly from the imprisonment in the Crete and labyrinth of Roman Catholic Ireland to the mainland of Europe, out of the imprisonment of the provincial interpretation of the symbols of Christianity to an opened out mythological, universal reading of the sense of these symbols. This is what Joyce intended already in the beginning here in first important work and uh, what he achieved, as you'll see as we go through this. We're going to take, uh, as Joyce did, the imagery of the Roman Catholic religion in which he was brought up, Irish Catholic, and having been the same thing, I know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and uh, release you from that, as he released me, uh, into uh, an understanding of the universal sense, the deep human sense, not the anecdotal historical symbolization of the sense of the, these great universal symbols that come to us through our uh, Christian heritage. The wings of art. Joyce very early defined for himself quite precisely a theory of art. And it is the theory of art that uh, formed the inspiration and structuring order for his entire work. And I think there's no question about it. As I said in uh, one of my earlier talks, <coughs> Thomas Mann himself recognized that uh, Joyce was the greatest novelist of the 20th century. And this theory of art, which he <coughs> has uh, formulated, and formulated very clearly, I take to be a, uh, a classic and completely uh, well understood and realized theory of aesthetics. One studies aesthetics and reads this author, that author, the other, it all seems so complicated. Joyce has really put his knife through all that complication and come as he has come to in every aspect of his work to a very clean precise uh, definition. So I thought it would be a good idea to begin by speaking of the vehicle, the art vehicle by which Joyce flew. What we're dealing with is Joyce's Daedalus flight out of the bondages 
of the provincial aspects of uh, the uh, tradition in which he was brought up. Uh, his flight from that to the great, great grandiose vision of his uh, final revelation. So, now I see a lot of people with pencils and paper, and uh, I think if you just draw a line vertically down the page, uh, and write on one side proper art, and on the other side improper art, uh, you will be able to put all this together uh, when you go home. Um, Joyce begins by, and by the way, this is in the portrait of the artist as a young man, and it starts about uh, two-thirds through uh, the book. He makes a distinction between what he calls proper and improper art. <clears throat> now the word proper means belonging to. This is my property. This is proper to me. Improper art is art in the service of something that is not properly the function of art. Joyce takes the word aesthetic in its prime sense, which means having to do with the senses. The actual apprehension moment. <clears throat> and so, proper art is going to have to do with the aesthetic experience. Now, Joyce defines proper art as static. It is not moving you to do anything. You are immobilized in what might be called aesthetic arrest. Improper art is kinetic, kinesis, move. Improper art moves you either with desire or with loathing or fear for the object represented. Consequently, moves you to action. You are not in aesthetic arrest. The whole meaning and sense is not delivered simply in the formal organization. So that's, that's the first point. Art that moves you, moves you either with desire or with loathing or fear, that is either toward the object or away from the object. Art that moves you with desire for the object, Joyce calls pornographic. All advertising is pornography. You are thumbing through a magazine and you see a beautiful refrigerator. <laughs> and uh, standing beside the refrigerator is a beautiful girl showing lovely teeth. And you think, oh, I'd love to have a refrigerator <laughs> like that. Turn the TV on. Every one of those uh, pieces of junk that's uh, coming through is pornographic art. Art in the service of selling you an object, making you desire it for <coughs> physical, social, or otherwise use. You see a picture of a lovely old lady, and you think, I'd love to have tea with that dear old soul. This is pornography. <laughs> you go to some ski buff's uh, home, and he has photos of ski slopes. You think, I'd love to go down that slope. That's pornography. You are not simply enchanted by the object that you're beholding. Art that is referring you to other places. This is one of the problems with the portrait art. Uh, the definition of a portrait is a picture with something wrong around the mouth. The, uh, <coughs> it doesn't look like Susie. But uh, is it anything in itself? Now when you look at Picasso's portraits, they certainly don't look like anybody you'd like to meet, but you'd like that picture.
the picture is formally organized and interesting. <coughs> okay. Art that repels you, Joyce calls didactic. All social criticism in the novel is didactic art. And from the time of Zola until day before yesterday, nine-tenths of the novelists are what might be called didactic pornographers. They are presenting you a social message turning you against capitalism or whatnot, and uh, presenting it with pornographic uh, chocolate coating that will hold your interest. <clears throat> okay, so what then can we say about the static? What are the moments of experience that uh, can be defined here? For this, Joyce goes to Thomas Aquinas. You see, his, uh, his sources, Dante, Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle, my, my, how old-fashioned. He goes to uh, Aquinas, and Aquinas speaks of beauty. Beauty is what pleases. That's a good enough definition. There are, for the beauty of an artwork, three moments to be recognized. And the Latin names of these are integritas, consonantia, and claritas. Integritas, wholeness, integrity. Consonantia, harmony, consonants. Claritas, radiance. And now I'm going to try to um, describe how this works. Let's take any, any little clutter of objects. I'm going to just take these things here that happen to be on the table. This is just a rearrangement of things. Uh, now what's going to be in the picture? Integritas. Put a frame around it. And the frame will, let's say, be like this. That frame cuts off that part of the table, this part of the table, this part of this book, and everything outside the frame is other, and everything inside the frame is to be looked at now as one thing. It's not a collection of things. You're not going to have an artwork until what's within the, pa the frame is one thing, not an assortment. So, integritas. This is one thing. Next. Consonantia. Within this one thing, what is important is whether this is here or there. And that's all that matters. The relationship of part to part, part to the whole, the whole to each of its parts. And these parts include colors, relationship of colors, forms, intensities of light, and so forth and so on. That's all art, art is. The instrument of art is rhythm. And this is tr true in writing, in prose. If you're writing simply to communicate information, uh, the only problem is the length, length of your sentences, that they shouldn't be too long, so that and the clarity of the organization of the paragraph, so that within the paragraph you're saying what you said you're going to say within the paragraph, and uh, you present a nice, neat thing. But if an aesthetic effect is to be achieved, then the rhythm of the prose counts. The precise selection of words, the way the T's and the B's follow each other along, and all of that counts. And, and so poets are interested in the sounds of the words. This is why you have rhyme and so forth, the pitches you pass, the words, and they, they mark rhythms and and so forth and so on. This is art. 
<coughs> okay, Int integritas, consonantia, and now comes the mystery. When the rhythm is fortunately achieved or rendered, you are held in aesthetic arrest. This holds you. Radiance, claritas, the picture, you say, aha, this is it. Why is this so? This is the mystery of art. A rhythm out there establishes within you the residence of a corresponding rhythm within, and you are fixed. There's a psychological value here, and that's the mystery. Now, if it is a rhythm and a radiance that uh, does not overwhelm you, we call it beauty. If it is something that so diminishes your ego uh, that you are in a almost uh, uh, transcendent rapture, this is the sublime. And what uh, renders the sublime is immense space or immense power. Very little art handles the sublime. I, I don't know any. But one can experience the sublime. For instance, one of the intentions of uh, Buddhist uh, monuments and uh, Japanese gardens and so forth is to bring you up, 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 so that the space that you behold becomes vaster and vaster and vaster. And there's a curious experience with the break, breaking open of a vast space, the diminishment of ego, you get a sense of release and uh, your own inner space opens out. And I have talked with people who have been in uh, middle European cities at the times of American and uh, British saturation bombing, this horrible business. And there you are blown by power so that experiences of ecstasy can, uh, can come in, this, in these situations. <clears throat> um, one of the astronauts uh, told me of an experience he had had uh, on one of the flights where he was assigned an extravehicular assignment, <coughs> what was called an EVA. And uh, there he was in his space suit, uh, attached to the module only by the, the, uh, the uh, umbilical. And he was to work in accord with somebody inside the module who was doing some other work that would match what he was doing. Something went wrong inside the module with the machinery, and so he was left for five minutes with nothing to do. See, those chaps were kept very busy so that they shouldn't be blown. And uh, here he is with nothing to do for three or four or five minutes. He said, uh, I'm going through space at 18,000 miles an hour, a minute or something like that, an hour. There's no wind. There's no sound, and the earth is up there, and the moon is over there. And he said, I asked myself what I had ever done to deserve this experience. That is the sublime. All orientation is, is blown. I mean, it's just gone. Uh, I don't think any artwork uh, can do that. <clears throat> integritas, consonantia, claritas, and it doesn't matter what the forms are. These are the basic principles that are analyzed and worked out in what is called non-objective art. That's just the ABCs of art. And you are not moved with desire or with fear or loathing, you are simply held in aesthetic arrest by the beautiful accord. What Joyce calls the rhythm of beauty, which stills the heart.
Now what this is, is a breakthrough. You've gone through the objects and the kind of transcendence is manifest through them. The, the transcendence of which you are yourself a manifestation. So that pure object turns you into pure subject. You are just the I, the world I, regarding beyond desire and loathing. Just as God beholds the world on the seventh day, you might say. Nothing to do. This is it. Now we come to the next problem in this aesthetic. Suppose we're composing a play or writing a novel in which there is action, in which there are characters, in which there are people who are not lovable, who are, in fact, hateable. Uh, what about the desire and loathing situation there? How are we to achieve stasis? Of course, this is something that Joyce is uh, concerned with since he's writing novels. For the formulation here, he turns to Aristotle, Aristotle's poetics. Now, Aristotle had the misfortune of being uh, preserved, his theories and thoughts being preserved, not out of his own writing, but through the notes of his students. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> consequently, it's not always easy to know what Aristotle really meant. Um, Aristotle speaks of the tragic <coughs> emotions. And uh, there is also the problem of the comic emotions. Now, the comic we're not going to have to be dealing with here. Uh, Joyce uh, doesn't mention it in the uh, portrait, but he does in an earlier work, Stephen Hero, which was a first sketch for the portrait, which uh, he never published, but became published after his death. Um, the, uh, the emotion of the comic is joy. Joy in, in what you are experiencing. There's no desire, there's no loathing, it's just delight. The tragic is something else. The emotions of the tragic are pity and terror. Now, terror is not loathing. This is, this is a fine distinction we have to make. So, let's define pity. Stephen Dedalus says, Aristotle has not defined pity and terror. I have. As follows. Pity is the emotion that arrests the mind, aesthetic arrest, before whatsoever is grave and constant, can't be changed, in human suffering, and unites it with the human sufferer. Not with the poor sufferer, the black sufferer, the communist sufferer. Unites it with the human sufferer. And we're all human beings. And we are being united to this person as a human being, not as a human being with a certain social character. Pity is the emotion that arrests the mind before whatsoever is grave and constant, cannot be changed in human suffering, suffering, and unites it with the human sufferer. Terror, the same definition. Terror is the emotion that arrests the mind before whatsoever is grave and constant in human suffering and unites it with the secret cause. That is the big word here. The secret cause. Now let's take as a, uh, a problem, Mr. A shoots Mr. B. What is the secret cause of Mr. B's death? Now what are we writing about? We're writing about the secret cause 
of Mr. B's death. Is the cause of the death the bullet? That is the instrumental cause. That's not the secret cause. This is a, this is a basic philosophical distinction between the secret cause, the formal cause, the instrumental cause. The instrumental cause of Mr. B's death is a bullet, and if that's what we're writing about, then we're writing something about gun control or something like that, a pamphlet on gun control. We're talking about the bullet. But we've got to be talking through the bullet to the secret cause of Mr. B's death. Now, Mr. B is a black man and Mr. A is a white man. So, are we talking about racial problems? Then Mr. B is not being looked at as the human sufferer, but as the black sufferer. And you're in a sociological work here. Now, what's the secret cause of the man's death? Now, I'm taking the black and white uh, intentionally with uh, Martin Luther King in mind. And I recall that a couple of weekends before Martin Luther King was killed, he said, I know I'm challenging death in insisting on this march. This is a man who killed himself, as we all do. This is what is tragic the mystery of the relationship of a man's life to a man's death. And he becomes a hero insofar as he is fearless in this. He is without the fear or desire, but is in movement in terms of his destiny, which inevitably meet, brings a death. And we're not in a work of art to say, oh, this should not have happened. We're in a work of art to say, this should happen. Hooray, that I too should die this way. Huh? then you've got a tragic work of art and you're talking about the secret cause. Mortality, that's the big general secret cause. We're all going to die and how we die is indifferent if what we're talking about is the mystery of dying. But then this becomes something that can be written about as a biography when you see how that mystery of this man's dying was a function of his living. And all life is this way. And this should not be corrected. This cannot be corrected. This is the grave and constant in human suffering. If you don't get through to the constant, then you really haven't got through to a tragic work. And what this does is open to transcendence the experience that's on the stage or in the novel here. Otherwise, it closes and you're in a sociological novel, which is no tragedy. Uh, now, a, a play that comes to my mind is The Death of a Salesman, which is right on the edge. <clears throat> it can be looked at as a complaint against the way uh, the, the, our industrial and uh, merchant system works, or you can look at it as something that is grave and constant, how this man's death and uh, suffering was a function of his own uh, lifestyle and so forth and so on. It's right, right on the edge. <coughs> so this is Joyce's vehicle now. Tragedy, pity, and terror. We look through the instrumentality of the operation and experience the secret cause. And the sufferer is not a black man, it's a man. Uh, we're, we're going through. Now in our thinking, in our newspaper reading, in our schools, everywhere, we're so involved now in the sociological that it's very, very difficult to see an event like this in tragic and not sociological terms. Everything Joyce does is, uh, has this breakthrough into, into the transcendent. Now the, the next point 
uh, with respect to his uh, theory of art is, has to do with literature specifically and it has to do with the difference between lyric, epic, and dramatic art. Lyric presents the object in immediate relation to the subject. The subject is the one who is the witness. The object is what is witnessed. In the lyric, the object is presented in such a way that it gives expression to the mood of the witness. What a lovely day. I am so happy. This makes me so happy. This is lyric. <clears throat> One of the problems of the lyric is that the subject should open up and become not just Tom, Dick, or Harry, but a vehicle of the cosmic witness and subject. That's, that's what makes uh, lyric poetry so uh, delicately <laughs> balanced between just egoism and a revelation. Dramatic, it presents the object in immediate relation to the object. The author of the play isn't on the stage saying, isn't she wonderful? Now, this is going to be this way. This is very sad. This, this is what this means. All you get is just the object. As Joyce says, the subject, the author, has pulled himself out altogether as God in his world. And yet, every element in the play is of the author's uh, own radiance. Epic presents the object in mediate, in between. Mediate relationship to subject and object. That is to say, the work, the object is presented with author's comment. It is carried on the author's emotion and comment and explication and so forth. Now, it's very interesting to me that just about the time that Joyce was working on, on this uh, aesthetic and presenting it in his uh, novel, Thomas Mann wrote a paper called Über das Theater, about the theater, in which he makes exactly the same distinction between the dramatic and the epic styles. Joyce decides on the dramatic style for his writing. Mann decides deliberately, these young authors, on the epic style. So that when you read Mann's work, for instance, The Magic Mountain, he is giving you the author's comment that lets you know where you are, what's going on, how he feels about it, and so forth. He uses adjectives that, uh, that say more than just uh, what the object is. Joyce does not do that. And this makes Joyce's writing very, very difficult for some people. <coughs> Ulysses starts out, you don't know where you are here. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown ungirdled was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altare dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely, Come up, Kinch, come up, you fearful Jesuit. Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and, where are you, you know? <laughs> Well, it takes a little while. 
and uh, when uh, when you've gone through the book three or four times and know where you are, it's very exciting. Because there's it's all protein. There's no fat, there's no carbohydrates. You've just got the sheer experience right in front of you, and it is a delight to read it over and over and over. I've never had with any other author that kind of experience. I bought this book in, in Paris in 1927. It wasn't allowed in the United States at that time. This was smuggled into the United States, my dear friend. Uh, and uh, I've been reading it ever since, and it's a, it's a delight every time. Uh, now, another author whom I rank in the same category with uh, Joyce, uh, Thomas Mann, uh, I, I would not have the same delight in reading it the 58th time. <laughs> I, I really wouldn't. <clears throat> so this is the advantage, this is the disadvantage of Joyce, and this is why for everything that Joyce has written, we have introductory books. <laughs> uh, the one for Ulysses, the best one is uh, uh, Stuart Gilbert, James Joyce's Ulysses. He tells you where you are. He tells you what the relationship of intro ebo ad altare day is to this whole thing. What's happening is that Buck Mulligan is on the top of what's known as a Martello Tower. Now, one reader out of 10 million will know what a Martello Tower is. And if you've never been to Ireland, you won't ever know. A Martello Tower is a kind of cylindrical fort that was built at the time of Napoleon when the British thought Napoleon might try to invade the British Isles. And they built these forts around here and there, and there are two right near to Dublin. Now, when you go into this fort, you, you enter and you climb a stairway inside and you come to a circular room. Now, since it's a fort, the walls, the walls are about three or four feet thick. And the windows are tiny little slats that open out. So you're in a realm that's totally removed from the world. And uh, within this tower here, there are three chaps. There is uh, Mulligan, <coughs> whom we've just seen up on the top, the top is, uh, again, circular, of course, and there's a parapet that runs around it. So he has come out holding his shaving bowl uh, of shaving soap with a mirror on it and a razor, and the b b yellow dressing gown is sustained behind him. And if you've ever seen a priest come out to recite, to uh, uh, perform the ceremony of the Holy Mass, this is what he's mimicking comes out as though he had the chalice with the uh, patent on top of it, with his gown behind him, and uh, he places this on the altar, the parapet, and uh, he says, intro ebo ad altare dei, I go on to the altar of God, and he blesses the countryside and so forth. So the whole book is going to be a mockery of the mass in some way or other. And we find at the very end here, toward the very end, a black mass being celebrated, actually. And there are moments of crucifixion and all the whole thing, and reception of communion, and all the way through, there's this being played. Now, there's a third chap here. There's Mulligan, there's Stephen Dedalus, our hero, and there's a chap who's rooming with them, a, a British fellow, an Englishman, whose name is Haynes. And when they sit down to breakfast, um, they're going to have fried eggs. And there are three fried eggs in the frying pan. You've seen three fried eggs in the frying pan. Three divine personalities and one divine substance. This is uh, <laughs> symbolic of the uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And uh, there's just a clue to let you know that this is what we've got here. Uh, when uh, they hack, they eggs out of the pan and put it on the plate, they say, uh, I think it's Mulligan, he's the one who's doing all this, uh, in nomine patris et filia spiritus sancti amen. 
So we know uh, the Mulligan is the father, Stephen is the son, and uh, Haynes, the Englishman, is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's really a very amusing affair. But uh, <laughs> it's more than amusing. What he is doing is, is uh, structuring relationships in terms of this archetypal relationship of father, son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you need a little help for this kind of thing, and, and, and it goes into high when you come to Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> now, when I went, went to Paris, of course, I didn't know that Joyce existed. So we were not allowed to know of the existence of anybody like this. It took <laughs> Joyce 16 years to get the portrait published. When you read it, you wonder what in heaven's name stop the publication of this, this book. Um, those were funny days. Um, so I am in Paris and I see this blue book all around with the great word Ulysses on it. And of course, I, I think, hmm, go in, avez-vous Ulysses? Maybe we, monsieur. So I go home and I start reading. Well, I don't know what I'm reading, but well, I came finally to a place that just stopped me entirely. <laughs> Uh, chapter 3, ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more. Signatures of all things I am here to read. I don't know what in hell is this. So I go in wrath to the publisher who is in Place Lodeon, Shakespeare and Company, and there is Sylvia Beach, this wonderful woman who, if it weren't for her, we wouldn't have this at all. She's the publisher. And I said, how do you, how do you read a thing like this, you know? Uh, I was over there studying medieval philology and uh, <laughs> what's this got to do with it? Well, she says as follows. So she gives me a lot of books on how to read it. And then, you know, I was hooked. I've been hooked ever since. Uh, the great advantage of this kind of writing is that it doesn't give you any help. Uh, once you grab that picture, you've got it intact and pure, and the rhythm of beauty is glorious throughout everything that this man has done. Uh, now, as for the matter of the dramatic, the next aspect of the dramatic, in the first place, he's not going to give you any help. But in the second place, the object is presented in immediate relation to the object. That is to say, Joyce's prose, Joyce's style, is going to be in the style, not of James Joyce at the age of 25 when he's writing, but James Joyce at the age of one or two. The portrait of the artist as a young man opens as follows. Once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming down along the road, and this moo cow that was coming down along the road met a nice little boy named Baby Tuku. His father told him that story. His father looked at him through a glass. He had a hairy face. He was Baby Tuku. The moo cow came down the road where Betty Byrne lived. She sold lemon plat. Oh, the wild rose blossoms on the little green place. He sang that song. That was his song. Oh, the green woath botheth. When you wet the bed, first it is warm, then it gets cold. His mother put on the oil sheet. That had the queer smell. His mother had a nicer smell than his father. She played on the piano the sailor's hornpipe for him to death. Well, my God. Um, we're in the, uh, on the mind level of a very small boy. And the style grows up as the boy grows up. And by the time you get to page 10 or so, you've reached the style that Hemingway adapted for his stories about his boyhood. I mean, actually, uh, I'm speaking the truth. Um, <clears throat> then you get into his uh, college years, and uh, he's writing in the style of Cardinal Newman. And so forth and so on. And, uh, and so it is as it grows up. Then you come to Ulysses, and uh, the style changes with each chapter in terms of the mood and sense of the uh, situation, 
also in terms of the time of day and how people feel at the time of day. This that I just read was bright dawn and sparkling, and that whole chapter is quite sparkling. By the time you get toward the end, after everybody's totally drunk and been knocked down on the street and had a hard time, the, the style is really just, it's the kind of style you get when you're teaching uh, prep school boys how to write. <laughs> it's full of extra words and roundabout sentences and uh, gosh, you never get on and uh, so forth. And then the final chapter, which is what most people bought Ulysses for, <laughs> uh, Molly Bloom's meditation as she's trying to get to sleep after having been waked up by Bloom entering the bed, in which there has been another gentleman all day. Um, uh, the, uh, the style, it just runs on without a punctuation mark. It's just the, the stream of her consciousness flowing on. And then you go to, everybody goes to sleep, and then comes Finnegan's Wake, which is in the style of dream, where every word, every sentence has five or six meanings. Big Mester Finnegan of the stuttering hand, free man's maurer, lived in the broadest way imaginable in his rush lid, too far back for messages, before Joshua and Judges had given us Moses or Helveticus committed Deuteronomy. One yeasty day, he sternly struck his tape in a tub for to watch the future of his fates. But ere he swiftly stuck it out again by the might of Moses, the very water was evaporated, and all the Guinnesses had met their exodus. So that ought to show you what a penchantucci chap he was. And during mighty odd years, this man of hard cement and edifices in Topers Thorpe piled bildung, super bildung, upon the banks for the livers by the sowing so Where are you? Here. And uh, it takes a little while to extract the 98 meanings that are in what I've just <laughs> given you. Uh, so the style of Joyce is one of the miracles, and uh, it becomes more and more delightful as you soak into it and, uh, and get the sense of what he's doing. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, that for one uh, major aspect of the art, and now the next. In this portrait of the artist, objects appear but he's always giving you what the object means for the, for the character in the book. His father had a hairy face, it, and, and it's sa said in such a way that we know uh, how, what the boy feels about the hairy face, because very next his mother has a, has a different kind of uh, face and so forth. And uh, it's always the boy's relationship to the thing. The, feeling tone that is associated with the perceptions. The feeling tone associated with the perceptions. This leads us deeper and deeper into his hero's psyche. Now since Stephen is uh, brought up a Roman Catholic and is trained, well trained, in the uh, iconography of the church, very soon the feelings begin to move in the way of, uh, of Catholic thoughts. For example, there's a lovely little girl that this little boy is interested in. And uh, when she uh, runs, her hair, her golden hair, streams out in the sunlight. And he thinks then of the uh, litany to the Virgin, House of Gold. She has lovely long neck and uh, ivory-like skin, Tower of Ivory, House of Gold. And, uh, and he's, he says, you know, Protestants don't understand these things. But by uh, thinking about them, you come to understand them. And the, the kid's working this thing out. And then when he gets past his little boyhood up into young manhood and is working on Aquinas and all that, the whole experience begins to be interpreted in terms of the philosophy of the church. So we are interpreting life experience in terms of archetypal systematic thinking as, uh, as we go on here. 